Faith is always right now. Faith is always needed. Faith is just not hope by itself. It's just not optimism by itself, but it reconciles all of those. And it puts forth action that's accountable, that's decisive, and, it, and, and, and it's empowered by God. I am your host, David Jefferson Jr. And Faith Now is conversations that we hold with today's faith-based and inspirational leaders. And on today, we are privileged and honored. And I'm excited about this dialogue I'm about to have with this spiritual leader, um, this man of God, called by God, chosen by God. And that is none other than my good friend and mentor, the Reverend Dr. Kirk W. Morton. Uh, Dr. Morton, how are you doing? It's, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you here today as we engage in this conversation regarding faith now. If there ever was an appropriate time for us to engage in a conversation about faith, surely this would be the time that it, that kind of conversation needs to take place. And for those of you who do not know, we're taping this on June 3rd, 2020. And it is at this current time um, that not only has the COVID-19 pandemic struck our world in a significant way with a blind side to the regularity of life as we know it, but in addition, we are also facing right now what I would call unrest as a result of the murder and I would say even assassination of Gregory Floyd, another African-American man um, who succumbed as a result of police brutality. And the world is on fire as we know it right now. And so for us, we wanna bring spiritual leaders such as yourself, Dr. Morton, to the conversation um, to get to know a little bit more about you, but also to get some insight on what faith looks like in these dire circumstances. For those of you who do not know, Dr. Morton was born and raised in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, he is the fifth child of the late David and Elaine Morton Jr. And Dr. Morton is an individual who has several degrees. Um, he started out his educational career, um, finishing up his bachelor's at Bowling Green University before he matriculated to Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, where he earned his Master of Divinity with honors. Um, and he continued on, if you will, to receive his doctorate as well. And so we are here with a gentleman who has not only worked um, for the Lord, but he's worked in the educational sector as well. And, you know, that kind of leads me to my first uh, question. Um, how did you find your way into the faith? I think that's a very good question. Um, I think when I think about my life, I grew up in the context of a very homogeneous community. Um, back in the late 50s and early 60s. And in that community, we were so tightly knitted that we were self-reliant. Hmm. And much of the uh, temperature was similar to the rates of temperature today. That's going across. I was a little bored when the riots broke out um, during the civil rights struggle between 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68. During that whole time period, um, the nation was on fire. And in my community, we had black restaurants, black cleaners, black barbershops, black black beauticians, black pharmacists, black grocery stores. So I grew up 
within a context. And, and as you know, the church back then was the pillar of the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of my family's faith, it was, I was just speaking with a friend the other day that they were speaking about how dissatisfied they were. And I responded to my friend and said, I'm happy because the very strength, courage, and determination that my foreparents had when they had to endure this plight, they passed that on to my grandparents and my parents. And my parents passed it on to me in this tightly knitted homogeneous community that I needed to know the Lord. And as you know, as a kid, I came to believe at the age of five, five years of age. I'm 64 years now, so you could do the math of how long I've been walking in faith. Mm. It's almost like when um, um, Samuel's mother took him to the temple and yeah. left him there. Yeah, him. And so, mm -hmm. and so I, I, I grew up in a household of believers. My grandfather was chairman of the Lord, and I really believe my father had a call on the ministry, but the wilds of the street had a greater grip on him, and he just couldn't break, break free from some of the uh, proclivities of life. Once again, we are with Dr. Kirk Morton. Dr. Morton is here today with us as a special guest, and he's given us a little bit more insight into his background in this walk of faith. Um, let's shift a little bit. I know that you've recently retired from working in the educational arena. You did some 29 years of service um, in that role in health and physical education in one of the most challenging environments of Newark, New Jersey. You've worked in that, in that field, but I want to get a little bit more into your calling. Um, what did your calling into the ministry look like? Did you have a, a spiritual awakening? Was it a euphoric moment? Um, can you shed a little light on your calling? Um, yes, I can. Um, right at the time, I was a member of St. Paul's Baptist Church in Mount Clare, New Jersey. And in 1962, we built our current edifice, which was um, the feature structure church on Hartley Street that we grew up from. And so we shifted. But at the time we built our new church, our current pastor was aging and became ill. And before he died, he brought to our church, a young dynamic speaker by the name of Reverend Dr. Calvin G. Sampson. And when we were doing his installation service, and I was about eight years old at the time, he had an indelible impact upon me. And as I was sitting in service, paying attention to what was going on, I had a perceptual reality as I was engaging with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> that this is what God was lining me up to do and, and to be. Now, at this particular time, at eight years of age, my focus was on athletics. And so I didn't have no idea of what about anything about ministry, but I did idolize the young minister who was a dynamic, charismatic preacher and he inspired me and in God. But it was a part of my life because I grew up in a family under the context of faith. Mm. And so uh, it came about as a, a, a perceptual reality for me. I didn't hear an audible sound. I didn't have... Uh, 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 where you say somebody fall into a trance and I see things in the spirit. No, it was just a perception that I perceived that God was uh, speaking to me at that moment. And, and, you, and you state something that really stands out to me. 
you know, you were put in the space and place by those loved ones so that you were pretty much enveloped in the faith. Um, That's and, correct. And, and what a difference we noticed that makes. It seems to me like there was no choice for you, right? Like a lot of times today, parents, you know, give their children uh, a choice if they are to go to, to do you want to go? Do you not want to go? I don't know about you, but you know, I was on drugs at a young age. I was drugged to church. I was dr drugged to choir practice. I was drugged to usher board meetings. I was drugged to um, deacon meetings. And I was just put in environments with my father and mother in the church that it became quite evident and clear that we were folks who were going to be in and around the word of God. Um, and it sounds like that is what, you know, the plan was for you as well. Is that f safe to say? Uh, unlike, unlike you, where my father was not necessarily uh, a leader in the church, but mm -hmm. he had a profound impact in the community. So okay. our name, so our name meant something in the town. But mm. I went to church because I love church. And so I got up I, all my life. I've always been in Sunday school. If I'm in church now, I still go to Sunday school. I go mm. to Sunday school. I've taught Sunday school. I've led Sunday school. I did vacation Bible school. I've been, I was in choirs. I sang in a choir. So for me, it was more consent for me, something that I wanted to do. And actually, uh, outside of the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts, the church really helped to formulate my values, my mm. ethics, my morals. And um, so that I found the church to be a place of solitude and solace, a refuge. Once again, we're with Dr. Kirk Morton. He is a spiritual leader. He is a man of God. He is our guest on today with Faith Now. Uh, Dr. Morton, I want to shift here a little bit because um, you, you stated something. You know, churches, mosques, masjids, synagogues, they're often, and, and it is safe to say that they are community hubs, right? Yes. Um, how do you see, and from your perspective, how do you believe faith-based leaders uh, can ensure reaching out to individuals during this disconnect um, as it relates to the social and emotional component of faith-based institutions and what they offer. Um, you know, the Bible says, uh, forsake ye not the gathering and the assembly of men and women. And we see the importance of assembly. What, what is your take now on the fact that we are not able to come together as a result of what has happened with COVID? Well, one of the things that I've always understood is that God is based on the premise that when he called Abraham and Abraham received the commission from God that he was going to make him a great nation. Mm -hmm. And while Abraham was in the process of dialoguing with God, God elevated him to not only become the father of Judaism, who would be coming after him under the line of faith, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change your name to Exalted Father. <laughs> so for me, I never had any question about Islam, Catholicism, Judaism, or Christianity, because I always looked at it through the, through the lens of faith. And if you look at Revelation uh, 7 and 9, um, where John received the revelation from Jesus, he says, at the coronating ceremony of Jesus Christ, there will be every nation, kindred, people, tongue at that ceremony. Hmm. And oftentimes when, when there became that great divide in the urban community among African Americans, when people split off and became Muslims, 
I remember that period very well. Now, I always like um, Louis Farrakhan. I always like um, Malcolm X, but I was a staunch supporter of Christianity and the work of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. But any of those three men, when I heard them on the radio, I was a student and attentive. Now, auspices of the faith motif. Now, mm -hmm. Paul tells us in Philippians 1 and 6 that, that when Jesus comes back, whatever work is not completed in us, he will finish that project. So I don't have a problem with any other faith. I, I see them all as brothers and sisters. And the common denominator is faith. Whether you're a Christian, whether you're uh, whatever Protestant denomination you believe, if you're outside of Christianity and you're Catholicism, if you're outside of Catholicism and you're a Muslim, if you're outside of Muslim uh, uh, being Islam, you could be any other one. But the key motif for me is faith. Ladies and gentlemen, we're with Reverend Dr. Morton, and he is sharing his emphasis as it relates to faith now. We're having a wonderful dialogue with him. Um, let's shift a little bit to what's happening in the world at this time. Um, you know, the headlines have read for the past three months in continuity as it relates to this COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, um, you can see how the world kind of here in America, particularly and all around the world, but here in the United States of America, things have shut down. But then most recently, um, the headline shifted and the headline shifted sharing with us the story of how Gregory Floyd was killed um, as a result of police brutality. What can you say to what is happening now as it relates to social justice? You speak of King. You speak of following King and, and listening to King's key words. What can you share with us right now from what we see with the unrest in this country as it relates to social injustice on people of color at the hands of law enforcement? Well, I alluded earlier that um, the context in which my faith developed was because of the homogeneous community that I grew up in and the teachings of my family. Now, if you are, if you are cognizant and, and conscious, you will understand that uh, throughout the world, when we look at biblical history, the first world pandemic that we saw was the one that occurred when the nation of Israel was in Egypt. And God brought the plagues upon the Egyptians to demonstrate to the Israelites how powerful he was as El Shaddai. Now you must understand, uh, Reverend Jefferson, that since 1720, Every hundred years, we've experienced a pandemic in this country. In 1720, it was known as the plague. In 1820, it was, it was the Spanish flu. And in 2020, we now call it the Corona COVID-19 pandemic. And I believe that in this pandemic, God is telling us, as he tells us in Isaiah 26 and 20, to stay inside your house, as he instructed Ahab when the nation of Israel came to Jer um, Jericho, and he told them that everybody who's in the house will be saved. Make sure you keep this, rel this um, scarlet rope hanging out the window, and if anybody in your family is outside of the house, we can't cover for them. He said to the nation of Israel during the pandemic, 
stay in your house. Isaiah prophesied, stay settled in place until my anger abates. The scripture tells us that there comes a time where God speaks, not because he's sitting in heaven looking down on earth, but his word has already been declared. And it <laughs> says that there will come a time in Leviticus where the earth itself will vomit up the inhabitants because of the corruption. And mm. so now, as we look at God, I believe that that only God could close down churches for three months as it has been done because of the shenanigans that are going on in church. So let, let me just put it this way, that if the church preaches the gospel, the gospel speaks to every issue that is pertinent and relevant in this day and time, whether it's transgender, whether it's homosexuality, whether it's the LGBTQ community, whether it's race, whether it's economics, whether it's politics, whether it's poverty, whether it's sickness, regardless of the condition, the gospel speaks to those situations. And if the gospel is not being clear, don't have the platform in which God can address the issues and the needs of the people, and most people in church, and this is not what I found at Metropolitan. I believe your parents are teaching and you are teaching and preaching the gospel. But in most churches, they got their own agenda. I don't believe personally in a person saying, this is the ministry of David Jefferson. I, I didn't. Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, nobody, no one will share the glory that belongs to the Father, not even Jesus, who is the Son of God. And so for me, this current pandemic is speaking because God now has everybody's attention. You can't say it's on the athlete. He cut that down. You can't say it's on the theater in Broadway in New York. He closed that down. You yeah. can't say that it's because of my work because he cut that only around the whole world. And now God is making people by his power to sit in your house Bible says, raise them up in the way in which you go, in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So for me, I see the pandemic as a move of God by his sovereignty and his omnipotence and his omnipotent power being omnipresent at the same time. And there's more prayer going on now than you go back to Second Chronicles 7 and 14, where he says, if my people who are called by my name, should humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and I will heal the land. God has the ability. God has the power. But are we going to lift up the name that's greater than all names on the earth? And that name is Jesus. Jesus the Christ. We are here with Dr. Kirk Morton, Reverend Dr. Kirk Morton, and he is our guest on today, a man called by God and led by God. This is a gentleman who has served in roles as a pastor. He served in roles as a chaplain. Um, we know the years that he has put in with Cathedral International Church in Perth Amboy under the leadership of Bishop Donald Hilliard the second. We're also aware that this is also a man of God who served as a pastor elect in Plainfield, New Jersey. And so to speak with someone, a sage such as him, who has been on the battlefield for a long time, it, it really speaks to, I would say, the type of spiritual leader we want to have on this show uh, to share about their walk with Christ. Um, let's talk about King for a minute. Uh, I want to. I want to lean on King. A lot of, a lot of folks, you know, when we bring up King, we like to bring up the King that is like the Lamb. Uh, we see a King who allowed individuals to 
throw rocks at him without retaliation and a gentleman who speaks about everyone coming together. However, there was the radical king. Um, and that is the king that I think the media and individuals lose sight of. And that was a king um, who was able to see, and we see this upon the precipice of his, his assassination, that he was pushing more for equality as it related to the economics of the people. When he shifted to that, that particular dialogue, it was then that he was snuffed out. Um, what is it that you glean from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, as he looked at what the ills of society were and then how toward the latter part of his life, he was very aggressive in addressing that. And do you believe it's, it was timely then and is it timely now? I think that's a very good question. I think that the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, he was a young man such as yourself. And he came and he was thrust upon the national scene as a young man. He could have chosen to do anything else. And, um, but this was thrust upon him. Mm -hmm. And he stepped up to the plate and he hit the grand slam. And one of the things that I admired about him, it was the bottom of the ninth inning and we were down by a run, and the bases was loaded. He represented lives the word of God. You didn't hear him talking about Dr. Martin Luther King's ministry. He wrote about 12 books in the midst of, in the process of being out on the streets all around the country. He gave a clarion call, emphatically mm. declaring to people, I'm putting forth an ideology of nonviolence. And so you can see the, the footage of the live um, abuse of police officers in Alabama and in Texas and in Mississippi, uh, where there was uh, systemic racism. But his commitment to the word of God and to the power of the Holy Spirit gave us that, that unity that unified this nation that caused other groups of faith to join in with us, such as our Jewish brothers, our Catholic priests, and all other denominations uh, fell under that umbrella and one of the things that I admired most about the radicalism of Jesus Christ, it comes out in Howard Thurman's book, The Spiritual Discipline, when he talked about Jesus and said, there's no greater humiliation than self-humility. And one of the things that Martin Luther King exemplified boastful he wasn't arrogant but he held his position according to the word of god he allowed the holy spirit to direct them and any and every time as leaders we stay under the auspices of humility we're heading in the right direction of the cross once again we are with the reverend dr kirk morton a spiritual leader to say the most not even the least this is a man of god called by god and he's given up his time uh, through decades of ministry, um, serving in the capacity of chaplain and serving in the capacity of pastor and serving in the capacity of leader. But most importantly, uh, this is a gentleman who leads by example. And, you know, this is my show, so I can say what I want. And I'm not controlled by anyone. Um, and I'm going I'm to state this publicly as a Young preacher, um, Dr. Morton has certainly done a lot to even just encourage and support me and the ministry that we're doing in Newark, New Jersey. And 
he's been one of these gentlemen who um, can kind of share the word with you, but is there to ensure whatever you need, um, you will have. And that is because he and I are also brothers in a fraternity unlike any other, and that is Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Um, I want to speak a little bit about that because I want to talk about um, some of the things that you've done in Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated, but more importantly, I want to speak about uh, Bishop Edgar Amos Love, one of our founders who is a bishop and the work that he was able to do as a bishop and what, uh, if you will, the faith means within the fraternity. A lot of times you have folks who are not engaged in fraternities, they don't understand and they see them in different lights. But Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated um, rests upon, if you will, the word of God. And we see that with one of our founders being a bishop. Um, can you tell me what drew you to Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated? Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, I believe that our fraternity, out of the Divine Nine, is the only fraternity of all Black national fraternity that's based on friendship. And we believe that the value of our community is um, greater if we have eight men who are thoroughly immersed in the true Omega spirit are greater asset than 80 with lukewarm enthusiasm. So what attracted me to my fraternity was the mere fact that my brothers would be my friends. It's almost like the relationship that Jonathan had with David when God conveyed to Jonathan that David was going to succeed his father. And relationship that was greater than even when Jonathan against the Philistines, that David brought Jonathan's son to his own table, Mephibosheth, mm. and Mephibosheth was slain and sat at the king's table. So for me, friendship. And then the second thing that we are, we are, we are, we are focused on cardinal principles of manhood, scholarship, perseverance, and uplift, where we want to go into our communities and be we do in my fraternity, which were the things that attracted me, friendship, our cardinal principles, and our mandate to be about service-oriented programs in the community. Those were the things, and I just believed in my brothers. And, I, and when you look at Bishop Love and think about what he was doing back at the turn of the century, mm. it's phenomenal to see the impeccable scholarship and what they exemplified as a fraternity on Howard University, whether you talk about uh, Cooper, Coleman, or just, we oftentimes, what a time, what a time we've had here with you, Dr. Morton, but I'm going to be honest. This is only the first of many appearances um, because we are going to want you to be a, a repeating contributor to Faith Now. Um, and so I thank you for your time for this, for this podcast and, and sharing this word and, and, and grounding us. You know, the title of the show is Faith Now. Um, and I oftentimes give my guests an opportunity in a minute or less to share with me what Faith Now means to them and so if you could you know give us an understanding what does faith now mean to you dr morton well the the title is almost kind of redundant because faith is now 
but mm. you switched it from the way Paul writes it. He says, now, now faith. Oh, Doc. Oh, Doc. You got it. I just got mm. Right? So when, yeah. when you look. That was good. Because faith becomes a substance, and not only is faith the substance, but faith is the evidence and the hope. So when you look for tomorrow, you need hope. And one of the things that the world tries to do is rob you of your hope so that it can destroy your faith. So if you don't have anything to look forward to tomorrow, your faith has been depleted. But God gives you faith when he says in Lamentations 3 and 22, I give you new faith every morning. So you never run short. God's faith is replenishable. Even if I exhaust all my faith from yesterday, he gives me new mercy. I think that one of the problems that we are facing now, because he gives us faith, and wherever there is no evidence of faith, there's no substance. Mm. But where there is substance, there's hope. So it's almost like the, the, the widow who had just a little crew in the oil. And yeah. Elijah said, feed me first. And then, and she never ran out because of Elijah's faith. So she just kept pouring. So the point I want to say as we get ready to close this thing up, I think that right now the shift of faith has to move from race. Black Lives BLM is really that important because we're not fighting a race issue. We're fighting an ideology, which is a belief. Race is an attitude, That's but right. ideology is a belief. Mm. And so this thing has lied dormant for 50 years now. And as a result of the presidency of Barack Obama, it has raised its ugly head, even though it was never dead. So we need to speak the truth of the gospel that we're fighting in ideology and not about race because the Bible already said every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people is going to be at the coronary ceremony. But your title is right. You must have faith. Faith is now, right now. And when the moment you have faith, that faith can be converted to hope that you can face whatever situation you have tomorrow. And this is what our foreparents, our grandparents, and I heard your testimony about your grandmother and what she meant to you and how she instilled in you to get to the place where you can make a decision for yourself about your own personal faith. I, I did a funeral just on Monday. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the great men that I really admired. And I told the people, death, is not the end of life, as we know as believers. And death is not the greatest tragedy. The greatest tragedy in life is dying without hope and without Christ. Because the, the life goes on in the spirit. But you can only make a decision with your faith now, because once you depart, it's indelible. You can't change it. And so if we're going to fight the battle of race, we're fighting the wrong battle. But if we want to fight that demon of ideology, which is a belief system, we got to convert people from an uh, inferior belief system to know that they're only talking about things. And what, what does Mark tell us? What does it profit a man? To gain mm. the whole world. Lose his soul. And lose his soul. Because mm. all of us are destined for death. But in Christ, there is no death, as he said to Martha and to his disciples. He's not dead. He's asleep. And his disciples misunderstood him and said, well, he was asleep, Lord. He'll wake up. He had to say, no, he's not asleep. He's dead. But Jesus called death sleep. And so it's faith. Faith mm. is now. Faith is hope. And when you got faith, you got substance. And when you got substance, you got evidence. And all you have to do is use the word of God, trust the Holy Spirit, and stay humble, and God will exalt you. Because he says in 1 
Peter 5 and 6, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. So what we got to learn how to do is humble ourselves before the master. And he is the king of kings. Dr. Morton, I want to thank you for joining us. We are going to continue to keep track of the work that you are doing in the spiritual and faith-based sector. We appreciate you. Keep doing what you're doing. And to my audience, if you have not been moved by the words that have come forth, I want you to notice that Dr. Morton rarely stated his opinion. He leaned on the word of God. And so I thank you all for joining us. And until we see you next time, remember as always, your faith is right now.